Hello, I'm Martin Bennett and I'm Professor of History at Nottingham Trent University. I've been studying the Civil War for some 40 years or so and it's because I think it's one of the most, if not the most, important period of British and Irish history that I've managed to remain fascinated by it. It was a period in British history that is often ignored but it had massive resonances throughout Europe and the United States and still does to this day. And because it embodies so many facets, gender history, political history, economic and social history, I've managed to remain fascinated in it for so long. I began my work on the civil wars by looking at the Royalists in the Midlands region. And I looked at the way their war effort and the war that they fought impacted on the wider community. I then stretched that to looking at, using similar methodology, to looking at the effects of the war across the whole of the British Isles, England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. And then in about 2004, I attended to the elephant in the room, Oliver Cromwell. And so far I've written and published three books on Cromwell, but now I'm looking at the other 196 Royalist, Parliamentarian, Covenanter and Irish generals. In the um, history of Cromwell, what's most fascinating about him is his rise to power. I mean, you have to remember that this is a man who was 43, which in 17th century terms is well into his middle age before he wore a sword in anger. Yet despite military inexperience, he became a captain, a colonel, a lieutenant general, lord general, and eventually head of state. He was perhaps more politically experienced in 1642 than he was militarily experienced, but his appearance in Parliament in 1628-29 was very brief and unremarkable, and his career as an urban councillor in Huntingdon was a complete disaster, indeed a political and personal catastrophe. Yet he was able in the 1640s, particularly in the First Civil War, to keep a balanced approach to both Parliament and the army. It was a trust in him by army commanders and by ordinary soldiers that helped him remain in focus throughout the 40s and into the 1650s. But it was his military ability that got him where he was. It was that astuteness on the battlefield that led to him being appointed Lieutenant General, General of the New Model Army in 1645. As a politician in the 1650s, Cromwell is of mixed success initially, but he was able to maintain balance. He didn't initiate the revolution of 1648-49, but he saw it as necessary and agreed with its validity. But Cromwell was a man who liked to consider his options very, very carefully. There were exceptions to that, obviously, his behaviour in Huntingdon in 1630 and also his storming into Parliament, possibly as a result of a mistake on the 20th of April 1653, are exceptions. The rest of the time he managed to remain uh, balanced and equanimous in his activities. He fought out the issues very slowly, sometimes and very carefully. He didn't take part angrily in any of the major events, such as the army's kidnap of the king in 1647 or Pride's Purge in 1648. But he did, during the 1650s, constantly return to the issue of what the leadership of the Republic should look like and questioning the role of a monarch in British history and society. I think it's probably the issue of the offer of the crown that shows us Cromwell most deeply. He obviously was, um, if he had a reset button or a factory setting button and you pressed it, he would go back to being a monarchist. His family, after all, had become powerful in his region because of its close association with monarchy. It had also provided favourite or popular members of the royal courts of Elizabeth I and James I. But Cromwell, when offered the crown, had already spent some time considering his attitude to it and he came to the conclusion that God had not only blasted Charles I but had blasted the entire concept of a monarchy in the British Isles. 
Some historians are convinced that Cromwell rejected the crown because of the pressure put upon him by his close army colleagues. I'm not. Cromwell saw the rejection of the crown as an obligation placed on him by God and an obligation he was glad to accept. Cromwell was, and still is, God's constable. He needed no other feather in his cap. And as God's constable, he remains the first, but surely not the last, of the commoner heads of state within the British Isles.